right. Well, hello. Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are. <laughs> uh, my name is Betsy Corcoran, and I am co-founder of EdSurge and an executive director at ISTE, which is the International Society for Technology and Education. EdSurge is a news and information resource. We do a lot to try to help people understand how to use technology to support learning and learning of all sorts, learning at home, learning in the classroom, uh, across K-12 and higher ed. And we do a number of different activities, including webinars uh, such as this. At the end of last year, EdSurge joined with ISTE, which is a nonprofit organization that serves um, hundreds of thousands of educators across the globe, all of whom are trying to figure this out as well. There's never been a better time to talk about using technology effectively to support learning than right now in the middle of the world pandemic sparked by COVID. For today's webinar, we've lined up a really amazing group of people to really talk about what the impact of COVID is on education. We're going to be focusing specifically on what our colleagues in China have been learning as they have been a month, month and a half uh, ahead of where the United States and Western Europe has been. Our guests are going to share what they've learned by transitioning to remote learning so quickly and some of the options for learning that they're now offering their students. And they'll share with perspectives both from K-12 all the way up through higher ed and international schools. We want to have a special thanks to Classin for supporting our coverage, our, our coverage of COVID with this webinar. Yeah, say that three times fast. You can see that we're using actually the Chinese online platform Classin to give you a sense of what some students in China are beginning to experience and how they've continued their learning throughout this pandemic. If you're watching this, you're viewing a live stream of the conversation. And if you want to participate, which we really hope you will, uh, you can hop into the live chat by downloading Classin and then creating an account at Classin.com. One last quick note before we get started. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available to you and uh, others uh, via email after this event. If you've signed up for the webinar, we'll also make sure that you get some updates and uh, hear about other recurring webinars on this topic. So over the last few weeks, as this epidemic has affected US educators, Ed Surge and ISTE have been trying to put together collections of resources. We started with this guide called Navigating Uncertain Times, How Schools Can Cope with COVID. Uh, and uh, it's collecting stories, uh, contribute contributions from both educators as well as from our journalists and some really helpful resources. Please take a look. You can find it online at readiness.edsurge.com. In addition, one more helpful thought is that ISTE and EdSurge have also been convening a huge number of resources as part of a site that we call Learning Keeps Going. There are more than 700 free tools there, along with information about what you can use and why you can use it and who can use it all during this crisis. Uh, and we also have an educator help desk. So you can find all of those resources at learningkeepsgoing.org. Okay, now for what you really came for. I'd like to start by introducing our panelists. I'm really pleased they have gotten up very, very early in the morning to be with us. We really appreciate it. It's about seven in the morning Beijing time. So first up, we have Michael Epstein. He is a principal at Nova Academy in Beijing. He has a degree from the University of Pennsylvania, has been involved with online teaching since 2013, and he develops and delivers curriculum for English uh, language learning, early childhood education, a whole host of different programs. Nova Academy has been going since uh, 2016, and it's an online experimental school that's offering rigorous English as a foreign language programs in small intensive classes, one-on-one -on -one tutoring and large interest-based classes and activities as well. And Nova Academy is using Classroom to support a lot of these different instructional models. And he also has been and is a VP of education at Classroom. 
Next, we have Dr. Wendy Gu, who's an associate professor in the Department of Education Technology at the Graduate School of Education in Peking University. In addition to her role as a professor of technology, education technology, Wendy is the founding chair of the Digital Reading Lab at the Graduate School of Education at Peking U, and has been a visiting scholar at the State University of New York and the Chinese University of Hong Kong, Free University of Berlin. Her first online experience dates back. She's been doing this since 2004. Uh, starting at her work with SUNY and has coordinated a couple of massive programs for training teachers and I think has educated something like 400,000 teachers um, through online programs. So we're very pleased to have you here with us today. And third, we have Aaron Lennon, who is co-principal of the UWOW International Education School, which is a bilingual school uh, in Guangzhou. Uh, Aaron's career in education spans over 25 years in state and independent schools uh, in Kent in the UK and now in China. He has a graduate degree in geography from the University of Nottingham and subsequent postgraduate uh, qualifications in teaching and educational leadership and an MBA from the University College London. So we have an amazing panel. So China ordered all schools be shut down in late January as uh, coronavirus infections began to spread. And that's a decision that has affected more than 200 million users. And even though online learning wasn't mandatory in the wake of all of these things, the Chinese government strongly encouraged it. And that means that as of early April, there are close to 1.5 billion students around the world affected by school closures. And so we wanted to take some time to really talk about what these early adopters have been discovering and learning and uh, experiencing. So Aaron, let's start with you. Your school moved from a physical campus into an online campus in about a week. And that's pretty remarkable. Um, let's talk a little bit about what that's meant for your staff. What are some of the traits that you've seen in your staff that's actually helped to make this work? I think, I think the context of what we did might kind of illustrate the uh, flexibility, adaptability, innovative teaching, uh, and great teamwork that uh, my staff have, have, have shown and delivered and exhibited over the past three months, really. Um, to put it into context, we last saw our students on Friday the 17th of January. Uh, we then broke for our two-week uh, Spring Festival or Chinese New Year holiday. Um, we got notification from the authorities that schools may shut on the 22nd of January. So that, that was getting ready for schools to shut. And it was a couple of days later that schools were told to shut right across China. Uh, we're in Guangdong province in the south of China, not too far from Hong Kong. Um, Guangdong province have been very pro e-learning and uh, it was the director of the local province that, you know, schools were encouraged to set up e-learning. Um, we'd already decided fairly quickly that we needed a good online platform to work with and we looked at a variety of platforms and chose class in. Some of the complications that we had at the time were that during Chinese New, holiday, New Year holiday, the Spring Festival, it's tradition for local staff, local Chinese staff, to travel back to their hometowns to be with their family. So we had local staff spread all over China, including in Hubei province and some in Wuhan itself, which is the center uh, of the outbreak. We also had our foreign staff, including myself. I'm from the UK. Uh, I was in London at the time. Uh, I had colleagues all over the world in every different time zone. Um, what we had to do is to work in teams, uh, local staff and foreign staff in different time zones to work together to actually plan the execution and delivery and transition of offline learning to the online learning world. And that was a major, major undertaking. Uh, we managed to do that in a week and we uh, opened our online school on Monday the 3rd of February. Uh, behind all of that is incredible work from our non-academic staff, the administrators, who created timetables, registered students, putting class lists into our online learning world, developed user uh, programs and manuals. And in that time, we trained our staff uh, online. Um, the first couple of days were a bit of trial and error and using the online platform. 
Um, and what really helped was some staff became super users very, very quickly. And they, we had, um, we used WeChat, which is a bit like WhatsApp uh, around the world. And we used that in terms of developing different groups. So we could actually share ideas amongst us as, as educators. Staff had to show a lot of adaptability and innovation because obviously if they're in Los Angeles or London or Beijing, they're not in Guangzhou, they don't have access to their resources. They don't have their textbooks, their teaching materials. So staff really had to adapt. Even when staff did come back to Guangzhou, they weren't allowed onto the campus. The campus is still shut for staff. Okay, so they had to show extreme adaptability and really a lot of hard work to um, transform learning resources into uh, an online world. So I'm really, really grateful for my staff for their hard work and adaptability. Um, the reason why we didn't choose video learning platforms in terms of recording video lessons and then you know, using those time and time again with classes is, is the issue of um, the isolation of students. Mm. Uh, using, um, this was really, really important because, you know, a serious pandemic like this, we expected that the schools were going to be shut for a long time. And we've now finished 11 weeks of e-learning. We're several, several weeks ahead of USA, several weeks of Western Europe in terms of our experience. So we, we determined fairly early on that social isolation of, of uh, students uh, and parents and teachers you know, in lockdown in different parts of the world and in different parts of China was an important consideration. So using mediums, platforms like this, where the teacher could teach live, could see the students, the students could see each other, they could see the teacher, also the parents, yeah, this is a great window on learning of the children. The parents could actually see in on the classes as well. And indeed, many parents joined in on our classes. So we think, found that interactivity um, of a real-time teaching where we could see all the students and we could use a variety of teaching tools in a platform like ClassIn really did help with the, uh, the issue, the psychological issues around self-isolation for significant periods of time. So uh, that's in a nutshell where we were, but there's an yeah. awful lot of, there's, you know, there's a I'm lot grateful of, to my staff. Yeah. We're going to come back and unpack a number of those points because you've made yeah. some terrific ones, the social isolation um, as, as a key one. And you are still in online learning mode right now, right? You yes. guys have not reopened yeah. the campus at this stage. No, we've not reopened yet. Some provinces in China have reopened yeah. for some year levels. Mm -hmm. the, the return to schools will be phased or staggered. Mm -hmm. Some year levels like grade nine, which is age 14, 15, are going back. And some of our senior students who are preparing for the Gaokao uh, University Entrance Examination are going back. But that's not the same with every province. Saying in Guangdong province, which is a big, big province of about 130 million people, uh, all schools are still, all campuses are still closed. Got it. We're going to come back to a number of the issues that you raised because I think there's a, a ton of great issues there, which is which include not just um, what the differences are between what you had taught previously and where you're going, but uh, even where where you started to some degree. But let, but let's come back to those. Wendy, I'd like to move to you for a moment. You had a little longer to prepare your uh, uh, particularly your doctoral students, your EDD students, for a move to online and picking up on what some of the points that Aaron's made, what, what are some concrete tips that you would really like to share with educators who are moving their existing courses online? Now you're obviously dealing with an older class of students, more university and, and uh, postdoctoral, uh, your doctoral students. But um, my guess is some of the points are, are similar. What, what, have, what are you learning? Uh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> For the Peking University, this semester is uh, beginning in uh, February 17th. But uh, our school, we have a program is EDD. Uh, their course is beginning from the, uh, you know, the February 3rd, February 3rd. It became the first program impacted by the coronavirus. And it also became the pilot experiment for uh, Peking University to move online. To help the teachers successfully move their course online, I write uh, a guideline 
uh, help them to to move course uh, online. Uh, my suggestion is uh, include <laughs> uh, three steps. And the first step, the, the teacher you 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 need to analyze uh, what type of your course. You know, uh, in, for the course is basically on the classroom. You know, it, it, you 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 use the reading. And speaking and speeching uh, and and discussions uh, such kind of course. Uh, it, uh, congratulations, you can move your course online totally. Uh, especially use uh, syn synchronous uh, uh, online uh, model like this class in. And if you are uh, your course is kind of like the seminar, you, you need a heaven reading offline. Uh, uh, my suggestions: You can use uh, uh, asynchronous online uh, online model. But if your course is uh, uh, is in need based on the label, for example, the chemistry uh, exam uh, experiment or the medical uh, anatomy and anatomy. anatomy such course, you need to wait to back back to your campus. And the second is uh, I get, I I suggest the teacher you need to know the advantage. Advantage and the limitage of the asynchronous online model and the synchronous online model. Uh, actually, the first uh, online course in history is a uh, asynchronous online course. The synchronous online course is widely used in the recent years. It's because uh, the, you know the network bandwidth uh, uh, was greatly improved. Uh, the, the two and for the native teachers, I suggest you start with the synchronous uh, model because it's very similar to the classroom and easy to help you to move in. Uh, just like a class in, we move the EDD use this class in, and uh, finally later the PTU move the to class in two. And the third is uh, record uh, card your content and redesign the learning activity. You know. Uh, of course, in the online scenario, especially the synchronous uh, like this, uh, the student need to con concentrate to the screen, and it's uh, a very short distance. They were easy to feel uh, tired, so uh, we need to cut the content and uh, uh, arrange many, you know, the uh, interaction. Uh, activity between the teacher student and the student to student. Mm, so great. that is my suggestion, the first uh, step. <laughs> one, one quick question for you while we have you here. Huh? Um, the Chinese government, I think, was suggesting that for small students, 20 minutes online is the right yeah, amount yeah. of time and then a break. And then for older students, I think 45 minutes and then a break. Can you say anything from the research that you have done about the choice of that amount of time? Is that what research has been showing is most effective? Or uh, any background that you have about um, how to break up that time would be helpful. Uh, uh, I think I, I have seen the, the many, uh, many uh, case study and they share with us uh, it's, uh, the car to break should be between the 15 minutes to 30 minutes is better. Mostly it's during the, this these times. And especially even for the graduate student, you need a break. So, you know, when you lecture 20 minutes or 30 minutes, then you have a break to, to question something or discussion a topic, such, such things. And also we have a, a professor He's very funny to to guide the, the 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 student online to do some you know tai chi examination. <laughs> Have a break. Excellent. Okay, great. Well, that's really helpful. So between fifteen to thirty minutes is sort of uh, yeah. sounds like what the research is saying. Terrific, Michael. Thinking beyond the logistics, what are some of the greatest opportunities that this online experience is really offering us <laughs> right now? I mean, there are a number of opportunities, but five big ones uh, that we've noticed are the chance for teachers to model 21st century learning because they're in a new environment. Uh, they're, as they're running their classes and dealing with this new environment, students are actually seeing them uh, employ critical thinking, uh, employ creativity in how classes are delivered. 
Also, uh, communication, collaboration, obviously in an online platform as they work together, and also the, the habits of mind, because we're all in a new place. And so unlike the offline classroom where students kind of expect teachers to kind of know and have a handle on everything that's going on, here we see authentic opportunities for modeling, uh, perseverance, grit, uh, as well as interconnected thinking as classes solve and uh, deal with problems together. Uh, furthermore, it's in line with a lot of national frameworks for education that are stressing uh, college and especially career readiness. Here we are, we're having a webinar online right now. <laughs> Students in an online classroom are functioning or working in similar environments, uh, just like at our, our jobs where we're communicating with people in different places, uh, having to use a variety of ways of communication, um, camera, uh, chats and so on. Here that is in the classroom and I, it, it really, I think goes along with uh, what educators like uh, Dewey really stress it's important in education, uh, the practical dimension of it. And then design thinking. Uh, as we, as teachers, educators are trying new things, as students are trying new things, what's, you know, getting something out there, what's working? What isn't working? Uh, how do I go back and iterate to improve the, the next performance of it? Uh, and then something that has, I know, been a hot topic in a lot of countries, uh, online communities that with online classrooms, we're actually able to model pro-social behavior in an online environment and creating these intentional communities so that students have real life examples of how to get along online. And I, what I'm really hoping is that this translates into a healthier online experience for our children as they're working with things like social media. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, Aaron touched on this. Uh, parents get to see mm -hmm. what their kids are learning. Mm -hmm. That I'm sure as parents and when we were students, um, mom and dad would ask, what did you do at school today? <laughs> uh, nothing. <laughs> now parents actually get to see what's going on, uh, which I think really helps affirm their faith and confidence in uh, teachers in general, whether it's online or offline, and in this new online experience. Yeah. And as Aaron said, parents actually getting involved with the learning experience, really strengthening that, that homeschool connection. Uh, just yesterday, I was reviewing uh, videos of uh, students doing a short uh, demonstration with uh, drawing like spiders with whiteboard markers on tinfoil and making them float. And a lot of them, mom and dad were there either doing it with them or you could hear them off in the background uh, looking in on what's going on. And I think these are really five huge takeaways we've had from uh, moving online. Really appreciate those. Let's let's dive into the parents for a moment because uh, I I used to have a joke with one of our elementary school teachers. I said the only thing worse than an uninvolved parent is a very involved <laughs> parent. Um, every educator laughs when I say that. Um, Aaron, have you had any problem managing the parents? Uh, do they jump in? Do they dive in? Do they want to take control of the class? Are you, cons you know, is there parent management that has to go on too? Yeah, there's definitely parent management, but not in the way of them, you know, wanting to influence what the teachers are teaching. I think the initial parent involvement, we surveyed all of our parents after 10 days of, of e-learning. So, you know, we contacted them all, had a survey, and, and we adjusted our timetable as a result, you know, made some of the lessons for the primary um, age children shorter mm -hmm. and put in longer breaks and produced a better mix of online and offline learning with the 20 minutes maximum or 10 minutes online, a period of time offline, come back for 10 minutes. And we're classing, you can set timers and things like that so the kids mm -hmm. know when to come back. Mm -hmm. So we surveyed our parents about, you know, what was working, what wasn't working for them. You know, they were concerned about eye fatigue, mm -hmm. you know, being in front of a screen for long, long periods of time. Okay, it's tiring. And for smaller children in particular, uh, it's, it's very, very tiring. So we adjusted our program after, after about two weeks in response to constructive comments from parents. Mm -hmm. And we phone our parents up uh, once a week, every single parent. Our school office is phoning them all up, keeping them 
keep in touch because it's it's a yeah we were in like the US is like yeah, Western Europe is a severe lockdown for you know, a long period of time. Mm -hmm. The parents are at home with, with the kids and they feel isolated. So having that contact with the school was really, really important. And obviously communicating with parents to get involved as well. And uh, some of the parents wanted us to set homework in a slightly different way, which was great. One of the comments came back, can you set homework, which is housework? So the children can mop the floor, they can <laughs> clean the kitchen, they can do the dishes as part of, say, homework for physical education. Or together we can do some yoga moves. And we had, obviously, our P lessons have been things like Pilates and yoga and stretches and things like this. And we've had great videos parents have sent back of the parents, moms and dads, joining in with the kids. Then the parents love this and send the videos back to this of them all joining in as a family. <laughs> so the interaction, you know, Michael's been saying, has been brilliant. So many, so many examples of STEM projects. You know, we set projects and whatever, because people couldn't leave their apartments for periods of time, okay? Right. We were all right. really, really locked down. So <laughs> kids were having to make, use resources around the home yeah. as part of their STEM projects. And the creativity was absolutely wonderful. That's really interesting. Let me just go back and you said a couple of really fascinating things. So number one, obviously communication, hugely important that you're communicating, yeah. whether it's through a survey, obviously through phone calls is ideal, although uh, certainly I know in public schools in the United States, that might be a little bit uh, more uh, complicated. Um, but um, did you have to set, did you set any kinds of, um, uh, you know, standards of practice or in other words, you know, expectations for either the students or the parents when you first started doing these online classes about, you know, when do you jump in? When do you not jump in? When do you, when do you interrupt? Were there, was there any need to set those kinds of um you know almost classroom management principles at all or not yeah really. we, we did that we did that straight off to be honest uh we, we had a kind of list of class in rules you know in the online world that kind of sort of mirrored the car normal classroom expectations in yeah. normal school yeah. okay so in terms of kids turning up on time not wearing pajamas when they're coming to <laughs> ho homeroom registration first thing in the morning things like that but to be honest the parents have not been um intrusive in any way in terms of the lessons or the learning they've trusted us because we set the bar very high yes. to begin with delivered a full curriculum but adapted curriculum yes. and listened to our parents and responded to the constructive feedback that we were getting so yes. i think that all helped Super. Did you just, and I'm getting a couple of questions from folks online, so we'll just finish this thread for a moment. Did you, um, uh, you said you telephoned, literally picked up the telephone and called parents. Was, were any of those challenging? I mean, you had everybody's phone number. Were there any, your, your classes are relatively small, right? So you. Yeah, we've got about typically about 20, 22, 20 to 24 students okay. per class. Okay. Uh, our school size is about 500, so obviously significantly smaller than a lot of the schools that uh, um, the people watching this uh, are, are managing. Right, right. Um, but we use every single member of non academic staff from our marketing team, our school office, uh, a load of other staff. Yeah, we're, we're on the phone. And if there are any issues that are picked up, then a senior leader would phone or contact. So that's a really good point, which is it doesn't have to be just on the individual teacher. You can use your whole school community to do that sort yeah. of outreach and then refer any kinds of questions. That's great. Um, yeah. Michael, I'd love to get you jumping in too. Let's talk about working parents for a moment. Um, there are lots of parents in the US who are trying to struggle to both do their full-time job and especially if they're small kids, kind of helping or managing the small kids. And when you have kids coming off and on, 10 minutes on 10 minutes off 10 minutes on 10 minutes off uh you know is that a challenge is that hard does that require a full-time parent to be involved or you know how how do you how do you get the kids to do the right thing i think uh especially with uh the younger kids uh one thing we've always recommended uh that might help with working parents is establishing a school space for them uh if possible so that they get that threat like there's the threshold experience uh especially with uh preschoolers kindergarten kids where they get to school and now they're in the school mindset trying to replicate that giving them a uh quiet space a space that's uh free of distractions to sort of uh to, to minimize 
things may be going awry. And then spending time at the beginning, like Aaron mentioned, uh, setting online expectations and really keeping the cognitive and effective load low so that kids are working with material that's somewhat familiar with them to build confidence and really put an emphasis on the routines so that they're coming when they're coming offline they're doing something that they are confident in doing that they feel like they're going to have success with uh, often children of really all ages act out don't do assignments don't do homework uh, not because they're lazy or they're bad. These, those things are absolutely not true. It's because they don't know what's expected of them and they're out of a safe environment and it's a way of them trying to get attention. What am I supposed to do here? So spending first couple days, week as needed, maybe even longer, acclimating them to that online space so that parents are able to work at home. And yes, there will be some flexibility you know, required. As Aaron mentioned, the school, his school, uh, they changed their schedule up a bit to accommodate parents' suggestions. And that might be something that schools will have to deal with with working parents as well. At least the nice thing about working at home, though, is that you have a little more flexibility in managing your own time. So <laughs> there are advantages <laughs> as well. Yeah, you think you do. It's true. It's true. Uh, but you do have opportunities to be with your children uh, because you're not having to, you know, go travel, pick them up. They're right there. Yeah. And you're not having to commute. So you're able to get the things done you need to do as a parent. Yeah. Well, also supporting your child in their uh, new education experience. Right, right. That makes sense. Um, Wendy, I'd like to go back to you. You talked about uh, thinking about the material that is being presented from the professor's point of view, thinking about that material and thinking about when is it appropriate to be asynchronous? When is it appropriate to be synchronous? Um, any additional observations that you have about uh, how much the teaching practices must change when we go all digital the way that we have. Any other thoughts on that? Uh, I think that, I'm, I'm sorry, please give me some tips again. Um, sure. Um, Maybe uh, if as as you think about supporting synchronous and asynchronous learning, those two different modes, yeah, um, just talk a little bit more about what you've learned about what we have to really do differently. Yeah. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, I think uh, we need build a, a strong uh, technology support system to help the, the, the teacher to move their course online. Uh, uh, in China, in the university level, we, we have uh, each course, we will give them a teacher assistant. Usually it's a student. The student can help the teacher to, to operate the, just the, uh, we, we have some <laughs> backstage uh, technology support. They can help the, the teacher to operate some complicated uh, manuals. And for the K-12 level in China, in the public school, usually they haven't enough enough resource to support them. So they, they have many uh, difficulties. So uh, uh, my advice to, to, to the school to help teacher move to the online is to give them enough support <laughs> and build a very strong <laughs> support system. That is very important. Yes. In fact, Aaron, you had made reference to the fact that when your teachers started going online, that it became clear some, some were super expert very quickly. And then you talked about using WeChat, which is an online chatting group, as you said, like a, like a Slack channel or messaging system. Talk a little bit more about what you observed, how important it was for the teachers to have the kind of support, even from each other that Wendy is describing. Um, and then uh, what's happened over time? How has that changed the longer you've been at this? Okay, we opened these channels immediately. Obviously, we offered online training to everybody. 
Um, and lots of people eventually found their way back to Guangzhou fair, fairly quickly, uh, those who are overseas and those who are uh, in China but outside Hubei province. Um, well, we opened up these channels on WeChat, um, the social media, in big, the biggest social media platform in, in China. And basically, we, people were posing questions. Um, I don't know how to do this. You know, how do I award a trophy? Or I want to give a merit to somebody who's done some good work. Or I'm not sure how to set the timer. I want the kids to come back in 15 minutes. How do I set the timer? It, it's, it's practical. It was trial and error the first couple of days. I, for me as well, because I teach as well. As well as being co-principal, I do teach a little bit as well. So I was finding this, well, how do I do that? You know, and the easiest thing, rather than going to the manual, is actually talking to somebody who's really good at this. And you know, there's always people in your staff who become expert using IT very, very quickly. It's a bit like the kids. You know, the kids today seem, you know, give them a remote, give a two-year-old a remote control for a TV and they'll work out how to use it in, in seconds. <laughs> Um, did you include did you include any of the any of the students on the the help channels? No, actually, when I was teaching, I was thinking, oh, okay, uh, how do I do this? And then one of my students, uh, Mr. Aaron, I think you need to do this. You know, <laughs> it's brilliant. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, I need to press this button. Okay, yeah. So the kids worked out how to use it fairly quickly as well because they were registered to you know obviously users. Uh, not quite the super user you would be as a, as a teacher. So we learned that during, during that first two weeks, we learned a lot from each other. And subsequently, to be honest, those um, kind of help channels, if you want to call them that, have really dried up. In terms of people asking for help, what people are now posting are examples of the students' work, whether it's screenshots or video clips, film clips of the students' work that the students are sending in. So it's transformed from me and kind of let's help each other kind of group to hey, let, this is my my class are doing and everybody's really being buzzy about the excitement that this is actually created um our marketing department loved this because it's produced <laughs> hours and hours and hours of really great content <laughs> to showcase not only the staff's hard work but the kids ingenuity yeah. it's been brilliant yeah what about any help channels for either staff or even parents who are struggling a little bit too. In the United States, we're asking a lot of questions about how do we emotionally support people through, you mentioned originally, isolation, uh, and through the fact that it, you know, even though in theory it should be easy to work from home, it not oh not always true. It's not, <laughs> it's not always what it's cracked up to be. Um, I'd love to hear from any of you about how you're trying to emotionally support staff and then whether there's any opportunity to extend that to students or even to families. I think the key to it is communication. It's really, really important to school leaders that you, you're regular communication with your staff. Some staff have felt very, very vulnerable uh, being in this situation, particularly if they're on their own, they're, they're in China, uh, either local staff or foreign staff who've got no family, they're on their own, they're locked up. It's, it was difficult to get supplies and provisions the first uh, few uh, few days, a week or so. Uh, and, and to be honest about communicating either uh, online, or I'm quite lucky where I am, we can actually I could get leave our apartment and go for walks around our compound, but not leave, leave our residential compound, and actually have those face-to-face -face chats with people. We had some people coming back from overseas who were then told they had to be in 14 days quarantine in complete lockdown in their apartments. You know, and it's leaving a, a chocolate bar in a bag on their outside their door so they can pick things up. It's little things like that which matter, and it's listening to people and being in regular contact. Because uh, we are all in this together. This is just a new situation for all of this. And we're all kind of helping each other out. Even the smallest thing makes a big difference to people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Michael or Wendy? Yeah. How about Wendy yeah. and then Michael? <laughs> okay. The course, the professor to organize the student to, you know, exchange the feeling. I mean, lockdown in the home and uh, uh, let, let them speak out with their, their, you know, stress or some pressures in their, in this uh, special situation. And, and I also know uh, a case, uh, a case is a uh, EDD student. They have the online party, party to, to you know, <laughs> To, to make the uh, social uh, social uh, activity to help them to 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 solution the emotion pr program. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Michael. 
as an online school, uh, this is something that we were dealing with even before the coronavirus happened because uh, frequently with online communities, uh, in a more general sense, there's always this worry about isolation, alienation, that feeling that can some that feeling that isn't maybe there in an obvious way being all together in a classroom. So we amped it amped up what we're doing a little bit uh, since the virus hit and we have now staff also spread out all over the world. But things like weekly video check ins, whether it's with our staff, um, we have a school group and once a week I'll record a video just talking about how things are going here, what I've been feeling, other staff uh, doing the same. And then with our students, because we have uh, chat groups as well, uh, whether uh, on the, the classroom platform and also through WeChat, again, uh, video sharing uh, so that we're able to, one, as uh, English teaching program, it's an opportunity to use English in a very real world way, like, hey, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm feeling. Uh, this is how things are changing. Or, hey, have you met my cats? Have you met my family? Uh, and getting students to share uh, little bits of their lives as well so that that social dimension of school is there. And they feel included in a larger community because uh, one thing we noticed that can happen is classrooms can silo that there's communication in the classroom but because you're not all there on a campus what's going on in other classes what are my peers doing and sharing uh sharing across the entire school environment uh through larger chat groups uh this is what's you know our grade two students have just completed this pro this project. Uh, let's take a look at you know what they've done. They've um, maybe done like a, a short play, a role play, or created a poster. So sharing successes uh, and challenges across our entire school. Good. Let's go back to curriculum for one moment. Uh, the social element is is obviously by far hugely important. Um, but let's go back to curriculum. And uh, I think, Michael, you'd said something interesting I'd love to hear from uh, Wendy and Aaron as well, which is you talked about you want to make sure that people have tasks or projects that they can feel they can be successful. One of the questions we've sometimes heard from people is, gosh, are, are we going to make it too easy online? In order to make them feel successful, we want to make it a little easy. Um, so my question to you is, uh, number one is, how much curriculum of the of the curriculum you thought you were going through this year how much are you actually going to go through and um does that sense of you've got to present stuff where they can be successful does that start to change or is that the way it is 10 weeks in as much as two weeks in okay somebody Three. jumped in yeah Oh, um, oh, sorry. I thought Michael was going on that one first. <laughs> okay, I guess because uh, we haven't been online, we haven't faced that transition in the same way. But yeah. uh, one thing that we really stress is you're not going to be able to do the same things online in the same way, maybe. But what you need to keep in, in mind at all times is working from your objectives, whether they're year-long uh, standards you're trying to attain or they're the day-to-day -day lesson objectives in the classroom. That when you think from objectives first, and I think this is really true in an online space, how you're going to use that space becomes a lot more intuitive. We need to achieve this today. And tools, strategies start to su uh, suggest themselves a lot more rather than thinking, oh, I've got all these tools, how do I use them? It's, where am I trying to get to? How can the resources available to me get me there? Yeah. So that, yeah, you will start slow yeah. uh, because you want to acclimate students, but you start slow to go fast later. Yeah, Erin, do you, so let's put it quite bluntly, do you think you're going to get through the same amount of curriculum this year now as you had planned to before? I think in, in a lot of subjects, yes. I think we'll get 100% coverage of our objectives and our standards. In some subjects, no. And so what's um, the difference? The why some yes, why some no? 
I think it, it's, it's those subjects where, for instance, learning Chinese that you need, you know, I would say that kind of face-to-face -face assessment and then the realization when you're actually in the classroom, when you've got the kids around you as a teacher, as you're wandering around, you can assess all the time. So, and there's quite in Chinese national curriculum, there's a lot of coverage in uh, Chinese language learning. So I think we'll probably only cover about 75% of where we need to be in Chinese. And we'll have to find some time, additional um, education time during the, the summer recess for a summer school to catch up on some subjects in order that we actually achieve our, our goals for the year. Um, as, as, as Michael said, you, you start off a bit slow as people get used to the system, but you do pick up the pace very quickly. And it's not about uh, making it easier in terms of curriculum, but it's making it accessible, okay? And there's a change in terms, some, some things that you do in the classroom, you adapt to change in the online world. I wouldn't say it's any easier. And in fact, some parents have asked us to set less homework and <laughs> to realize, wow, this is really high level. This is really difficult, you know? Um, but you set the bar high, you know, uh, because you want the students to achieve um, the objectives that you want to, you started at the beginning of the year. Just because the campus is shut, school is still open. You know, learning is still happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, as educators, we want, um, with the other pressures and mm -hmm. socialization and the psychological impacts to consider, and to put into the mix as well, we want to try and, uh, and achieve meeting our goals as a school for the year so that students can see progress. Uh, as soon as we go back to campus, which we, we expect to be probably after national holiday, which is beginning of May, we expect to go back. Um, one of the things, first things that we'll be doing, we'll be actually measuring progress. There'll be some assessments to actually measure this, you know, e-learning progress. How much yeah. of our students made progress over this time? Yeah. You know, we've been doing various assessment points throughout the 10 or 11 weeks that we've been doing this. Yes. But I think we'll probably get more accurate data when we're back at school. Are these going to be different assessments than you would have normally administered at that point in time? Yeah. 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 Interesting. Um, Wendy, let me, um, I'm going to jump in because we, we're, we're going to start running out of time. There are a few more questions to get to. Um, have any of you dealt, and maybe Wendy, you could speak about this nationally, about how to work with students who may not have access to technology at home? Have you encountered students who can't get to a strong enough internet connection or maybe don't have the technology at home? to make full use of platforms. Have, have any of you seen this? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, th that's, yeah, th that's true difficult in China. Uh, yeah, yes, it's true some, some students, they cannot access, uh, access to the internet. In China, some province to provide the student uh, use a TV, use a TV channel to give them the, the, the course. and. Yeah, then that's maybe lost some 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 uh, quality maybe, but but the TV and radio sometimes is a support for the student. Then that is depend on different technology. So it's sometimes work, you know, for English or for language learning, and the radio and TV is still an option for 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 us. Yeah, is there a concern in China about whether uh, some students get left behind because they they may not have this access then? Yeah, I think it's, it's true. It's uh, exist. Yeah, maybe. And it's not all the problems in this uh, pandemic, during this pandemic period, can, can can move all the things to online. Yeah, your, your, your question is, I think it's a problem. Yeah. Still in China. Yeah. 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 Not not all schools have had the resources to be able to make the shift that perhaps my school has. Um, it's expected that all schools in China, whether they're you know uh, public schools or their their fee paying schools, will will be asked to offer what's called make up time or additional time either at weekends um, or extending into the summer holiday uh, for students to catch up and the. Uh, national entrance exam to university, the Gaokao has been delayed by a month. Um, so we, we expect that our semester two for us uh, in China will be extended. Mm. And uh, mm. sorry, Michael, go ahead, please. I was going to say, as we're seeing these things, what we're really seeing is just 
it's on a larger scale, but communities uh, worldwide on a much smaller scale have dealt with these things historically. I grew up in New England. There were several years of my schooling where we were, there were so many snow days. And we were coming in on the weekends uh, to make up classes because the school year had to, kind of like Massachusetts at the time, I think state law, the school year had to end by a certain day. So we're just seeing this on a much larger scale um, in terms of having to make up time, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think what's helped us is having real time learning and curriculum coverage as we've done. I think those schools, and I think a lot of public schools have used video lessons where teachers have got to record lessons or using state produced materials, which are video lessons, which then kids watch at home. Obviously there's no interaction uh, with the teachers in mediums like that. Other schools have just posted things on the school website, tasks or project-based tasks, project-based learning tasks for periods of time. That doesn't work quite frankly. You know, the kids are not going to make progress. The teachers lose contact with the kids very, very quickly. So um, my advice to anybody out there who's watching this, if you can offer real-time learning face-to-face, -face, it's very, very effective. And you'll find that the curriculum coverage, you'll get through what you need to get through and have that day-to-day -day contact with the students is, is vital in a period where you will be locked down for several months, not just weeks. If anything, it's probably doing, this crisis is probably doing more to underscore how important those relationships between teachers and students, and even between students and each other are, right? That it's not just about yeah. opening brains and pouring information in, <laughs> it's about those relationships and how we're trying to build those. Yeah, um, don't, don't forget the pastoral work of the school. Schools are not just about <laughs> academics, the pastoral side of the school is, is equally important. Right, right, right. Um, wh when you think about next school year, when you think about September of next year, how do you think your teams are going to prepare differently than they did for last September? Wendy, <laughs> you're smiling. <laughs> um, We're all smiling. <laughs> I, I, I think that maybe uh, we have more uh, option to run our course, just like uh, this webinar. And uh, we, we, we have, uh, we located in different uh, place, but we can have this webinar. So uh, uh, I think in, in our school, we have discussion about this, you know, because it's a <laughs> education school. And we, we, we think about maybe we, we will have more, you know, cooperation between the China and the United States or the UK, such things, such a new program will be run online. And maybe we can cooperate the school and the uh, entrepreneur to, to, to design some new course. So I think this is, this is a very good uh, opportunity for all the students, all the teachers to, to be training <laughs> online. And so many uh, teachers and students, they have experience online learning. That is very important things for the future. Yeah. And one other question, which is when you think about the feedback that you've been getting from students, what have you, have you guys been surveying your students and getting feedback yeah, from yeah. them? What, what's been some of the comments you've heard back from the students? Uh, we have a survey for the EDD student. And uh, the finding include, you know, uh, the student attend more uh, course online. Uh, be before this online course, when we teach them on campus, you know, the EDD student, not, not all of them is in Beijing, mostly is the outer Beijing. So if they want to attend, their, you know, even they, they have get the credit of this course, but when they prepare their dissertation, you want to to beg to attend the course to you know review some 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 point. They cannot they cannot come and spend many time many money to come here. But when we move it online, more, the student attend more course. They, they told us that is amazing. Yeah, and uh, we also ask them whether you you think we can move all the program online. 
and uh, I think more than 50 percent students they like to still online to learn this course. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I think this is amazing. <laughs> oh, that's very interesting. Aaron, Michael, do you uh, what's wh what are your students saying, and do they want to stay? Well, Michael, you've sort of already been online, so that maybe it's a cheap yeah. to ask you that question. But Aaron, do you think your students <laughs> want to come back, or are they happy to be online? <laughs> They want to come back to campus. Um, yeah, yeah. I think so they, definitely, our, definitely. They, they, they miss their teachers. <laughs> the little comments, particularly from the primary age, um, the elementary age, yes. it's so sweet and so cute. I miss my teacher. I want to come back. Oh, it's just yeah. really cute. And, uh, we we'll get these and, little video messages. That's sweet. Any any other feedback that they've given uh, about this experience that's particularly instructive for the future? I think that. I think they've appreciated the creativity of the teachers under difficult circumstances. And to be honest, teachers have had to be more creative and more adaptable because the novelty of e-learning, and for us it was a novelty, obviously Michael's very experienced with this, but for us it was a new world, and for our teachers it was a new world, and for our students it was a new world. So for the first two weeks, hey, this is all new, wow. Then after week three, they are. Oh, it's you know we're going to be like this for a long time so our teachers really had to step up and really use every ounce of their creativity to uh, keep the motivation levels high wow. yeah we've had students moan moan about the lessons saying oh too much <laughs> homework or too much online or it's too intense you know you get all of those things but you would get those anyway during normal school day yeah so in the last couple of minutes we have if you could each offer again one tip for other schools that are you know other schools in other countries are still probably a month or a month and a half behind you. So as you think about the the journey you have been on these past 10 weeks, one tip that you could offer our other educators. Michael, shall we start with you? And uh... Sure. Uh, one tip, wow. I guess, and we've kind of mentioned this, all of us throughout this uh, webinar, but it's worth stressing, take the journey together. Learning is a fundamentally social experience. Uh, it's not as I believe Aaron and uh, you Betsy said, it's not about opening up their heads and pouring knowledge in exclusively. Uh, learning happens together. So keep connected with your students, offer opportunities for interaction, especially more uh, informal interaction, keep the parents involved, uh, be communicating so that everyone feels part of a school community as they would in an offline setting. Thank you. Wendy? Okay. Uh, my tips is uh, uh, start from the synchronous online platform. That is very similar to the cl classroom. If you are uh, ICT condition is good. Fantastic. Aaron? Um, I echo the points that have been made and, and one kind of observation I suppose about what we've learned is the staff have learned an awful lot about themselves mm -hmm. and they've learned a lot of how to work more effectively in teams. So when you ask the question what's going to be different you know next semester when we go, go back the new academic year I think if, in, if, if anything the teams are going to be much stronger because we actually know, all of us now know our strengths, because I can watch every single lesson that's going on in my school, okay? So I can pop in and out on using Classid. So I've seen everybody teach, which has been a real, real really great opportunity for me as a, as a principal that, you know, I wouldn't normally get in my routine kind of week, not to see everybody teach. And the parents have seen that as well, so they know the character and the creativity and the, the uh, caliber of, of our teachers. So one lesson learned is teamwork. And if anything, this whole experience has strengthened our teams for next academic year. That is a fantastic, fantastic note to end on. Uh, so uh, I would like to first give my huge thanks and appreciation to all three of you, uh, Aaron Lennon from UWOW International, uh, Dr. Wen Jing Go from uh, Peking University, and of course, Michael Epstein from Nova Academy in Beijing. Thank you all so much for sharing your thoughts and, and your learnings from us. 
Uh, thank you as well to Classen for sharing this platform. It's been very interesting. It's the first time the EdSurge team has used this platform as well. <laughs> and um, it's been a, a great experience. And if anyone wants more information on Classen, you can certainly reach them at classen.com. And uh, there's lots of details there. Again, my name is Betsy Corcoran. I'm co-founder of EdSurge. We provide all kinds of resources and news, and we are trying to keep our community together. So please feel free to reach out to me. You can reach out to me at Betsy at EdSurge or feedback at edsurge.com. And uh, you're also welcome, of course, to sign up for our free newsletters and find out all about the other resources we, we have. Again, thank you so much to our panelists, to Classen. Thank you very much for participating online and uh, have a great day or night or wherever <laughs> you are. Thank you so much. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, bye.